Welcome to the Monday edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 324. Oh, I'm not sure what edition this is. It could be the terrorism edition. It could be the more report edition, but it's going to be a lot of fun. I'm Kevin Carlson. I'm Gavin Ashenden, and it's Monday, the 18th of September, 2017. Part of our update should always be, where are you recording from? Because sometimes it's, oh, wow, I'm over here in, you know, France today in the, the Isle of Normandy, and I'm just having a little fun at the cafe. Sometimes you're in Russia. Sometimes you're, uh, you know, floating around Europe somewhere. And now I, I see something completely different. And uh, where are where is Gavin? That's going to be a book someday. Where's Gavin today? You know, Kevin, I've just come back from a conference in Cambridge, and uh, someone was complimenting you on on, on the show and, and uh, complaining about your dog, which photobombed the, the show all the time. And I said, yes. it wasn't Kevin's dog, it's my dog. <laughs> and <laughs> and um, so, in fact, I'm, I'm now in the chapel of St. Michael and All Angels, which is uh, the garden shed my wife has given over to me for a chapel in England. Uh, Facebook friends will see pictures of it. And actually, we, we say morning prayer from here every morning. And on Saturday night, when I did Compline, we had 500 people join in. So it's a it's a rather beautiful shed um, and uh, set in the middle of the English countryside. And there is a sense of the presence of God, a great place to pray in. And I just thought it would also mean, if I did from here, that the dog could no longer photobomb us. <laughs> You'll see. <laughs> You know, dogs are people, yes, we'll too. They get to be on, on camera anytime. Um, yes. For people who like the show, like those who travel and meet Gavin, uh, if you would please go to YouTube and click the like button or go on Facebook right under the uh, uh, the video you're watching right now, click like, and uh, that helps populate uh, the video further amongst the Internet. I'm also taking a trip soon to Atlanta. Uh, the continuing Anglican churches are having a joint synod, and they invited me down, but uh, I'm going to have to pay my own way. Not a big deal, uh, because I have wonderful people who like to donate to the program uh, to, to help me travel, and I'm still, you know, uh-oh, uh somebody's trying to contact me. Too bad. Uh-oh. -uh. Turning that off. <laughs> this show must go on. Uh, if you could go to anglican.inc forward slash donate, it's in the YouTube uh, show notes if you want to just click the link. And, uh, I, you know, a couple thousand will get me there. Maybe $10,000 is fine. You know, big deal. Uh, I could fly business class for once. Uh, and that will help me get there. Um, on to the show. Since we last talked, there's been another terrorist incident, um, and it was just released by the BBC this morning that the gentleman, uh, the main suspect, is Syrian and had just uh, recently uh, crossed the border into the UK. Um, it seems like this is the standard uh, modus operandi uh, of what's going on in Europe the last 12, 13 years now. Kevin, it's terrifying. Um, several of my friends have said that their wives and children take the uh, what we call the tube, but the underground or the metro. Um, this man had put uh, an amateur incendiary device together and filled it with nails designed to cut through the skin and do as much damage as possible. And still the media uh, won't say they are Muslims intent uh, on destabilizing our society. So we live with this, this, this conspiracy of silence. Um, and in one sense, of course, this certainly means that, um, uh, that, that, that uh, the, the local Muslim community don't have to pay the price for the extremists. But, but the problem is that we already know that a very large proportion of the Muslim community are in favor uh, of Sharia law uh, and, in, and, and sympathetic to, to the violence. So we, we have a, an enormous, a problem of enormous proportions in our society, particularly when it comes to the sense that the security forces and the police and the immigration authorities uh, are increasingly relaxed about this threat 
um, to our to our, our our safety and our social lives. It's it's really very serious and very worrying. And of course, it's throughout Europe. It is, and what worries me most is you know we've had a relative yes liberal press for many many years uh, in Europe here in America, but they've always served us to some extent. They've provided you know, an accurate news, a factual news, at least till the, the mm. late 90s. <clears throat> um, and now they've, you know, taken some news and said, because we're better than everybody else, we don't really need to cover this. It'll be the whole helpful for society if we just don't cover the, the, the problem with radical Islam. And maybe it will just go away. And it hasn't. Um, yet the press is going to continue down this road, uh, and it's endangering all of us. Well, it really is, and it, it's partly because our society, as well as the liberal press, does not understand Islam. It keeps on imagining it's a kind of Arabic version of Christianity uh, and making false comparisons. Uh, and also people have, have failed to study history. They, they don't understand that there is, there is not a single part of the, on the earth's skin where Islam has been, that it's given up willingly. And the only place I can think where it's been reclaimed from its its violent hegemony uh, is, is Spain. Mm -hmm. um, but you may have heard recently again that Muslims have said, well, it's ours, we're going to take it back. Um, we're living in a very serious struggle. But Western liberalism is not capable of uh, of describing it or, or standing up to it. And I think one of the things that the, the Christians need to do is to recover the voice and say, look, um, this really is a, a most a most powerful conflict for your consciences as well as for your souls. If you don't think you've got a soul, at least consider you may have a conscience, and your conscience may need free speech, just at that level. Uh, but to do that, the church ha the churches have to find the courage to stand up in the face of accusations of racism or, or phobia, uh, and do their best to tell the historical uh, and the intellectual and philosophical truth. Okay. Yes, <laughs> indeed. Um, another thing I wanted to talk uh, with you about was the what we're calling the the Philip Moore report. Uh, Sir Philip Moore was uh, asked to write a report mm. dealing with the Philip North uh, uh, issue that occurred uh, earlier this year. For those who don't know, uh, Bishop North was going to be uh, nominated to the it was the salisbury wasn't it sheffield sheffield, sheffield that's right sorry i don't mm. i'm not from over there i don't know all your diocese <laughs> by heart um to to the see of sheffield he's going to be the bishop there um the one problem is he couldn't make uh the merits because he would never uh consecrate or ordain a woman to the priesthood diaconate or uh as a bishop um, and that just caused absolute consternation. And as a surprise to the Church of England, his nomination was, uh, he, he backed out of the nomination. And we now have this report, 75 pages written by an Englishman, uh, which is, uh, <laughs> brings up four grand details that we should probably talk about. First, why is the Church of England surprised? Well, of course, it isn't surprised. Um, what is discovered is that the, the compromise and the arrangement that it set out in order to go ahead with the consecration of women, in order to buy the votes of people on Synod, uh, this, this agreement hasn't held. What it ought to say is it hasn't held. It, again, it ought to tell the truth about it. But rather than tell the truth, it's, it's, it's kicked it under the carpet and had a report instead. And so here we have the report. And um, Freud, Freud had some one two interesting things to say about life. He wasn't always wrong. One of the things he said that was when people protest about something too much, it, it, there may be truth in there. So Philip Moore begins by saying, um, I, I don't believe there are any villains here and I'm not going to look for them. That means there are villains there and he should have looked for them. Um, but, but he's chosen not to make people accountable. Essentially, this was a kind of crowdfunded campaign which was designed to, to, to get a mob together to shout Philip North down and get him out and, until his nerve broke. Uh, his nerve did break and he, and he left. There ought therefore to be some accountability for the people who got the mob together uh, to, to attack him and to make him withdraw from what was a perfectly proper 
mutually agreed process of appointment in which everything was done right. So what is the report to do? Well, um, if it's not to point the finger at people who deliberately tried to subvert it, then it, it's going to essentially be a form of cover-up. Um, I don't mean cover-up in the sense of being deceitful. What I mean is, is um, uh, be less than focused about what was going on. So the first thing Philip Moore said was that, that there are no villains here and I'm not going to look for them. And, you know, that's the big issue. This is, I mean, this could have been written by the British press. It's not what you think it really is. The, the problem really was, you know, Philip North. The problem wasn't uh, that we're not mutually uh, uh, flourishing. It was interesting. They, they brought up, and how could this occur, something called a theological challenge. You know, we, we, <laughs> wait a minute. How could we have a theological challenge when both uh, communities agreed to mutually flourish? There should be no challenge whatsoever. Well, for example, there are there are dioceses which have women bishops, which contain f faithful, traditional evangelicals and Catholics who haven't attempted to subvert the appointment of the women bishops. They've accepted the agreement. Um, it's, it's a microcosm of the whole uh, struggle we have with the left. Uh, people who are progressives and hold left, left of center politics and ideologies um, are, are not even handed when it comes to dealing with moral values. So uh, Martin Percy, Dr. Martin Percy, who's the Dean of Christ Church, who's married to his, his wife called Emma, I mean, he would be married to his wife, of course, but his, his wife, Emma Percy, is chairman of WATCH, mm -hmm. which is uh, the women's movement for uh, the ordination of women. Um, and together as a pair, they campaigned vigorously uh, against Philip North and um, were... Uh, we're right at the centre of trying to challenge this agreed process of mutual flourishing. Now, the question is, does this political activity by the Perses constitute a theological challenge? Well, no, it doesn't. We, we agreed that the, that the theology we're doing was mutual flourishing. There are two separate uh, alternative, mutually opposed theologies of sacred ministry. We know that. Uh, this was a political action. Philip Moore, instead of calling it that, has said, well, the, the, the Perses are raising a theological proposition. So what will we do about it? Well, that's all we've miscalled it. It's not that. It, it's political. But if it's theological, he's, he's invited the Faith and Order group, who are a, a group of eminent theologians who occasionally pronounce on Anglican theological problems, um, to, ha to have a look at this. Um, because why would the bishops want to take responsibility for, for the... Um, for the settlement that they had constructed. You're right. You... <laughs> okay, well, we need to let people in here. Until I finish my coffee, there's really no show. I'm, I'm going to sip real quick here. <laughs> so the, the, the phrases that you were about to create were that there'd be no senior positions, including archdeacons, mm -hmm. uh, uh, dio suffragan, uh, or diocesan bishops. Essentially, not a single Anglo-Catholic has been... Uh, offered the responsibility of a leadership position in the Church of England since this commitment to mutual flourishing. How many women bishops have there been? I mean, you might, for example, say that if really we were committed to mutual flourishing, if this was honest and true, then you might expect the same number of Anglo-Catholics to be given res senior responsibility as women that have been appointed. Well, I forget to count how many women bishops we have now. God bless them, but there's quite a few. Um, but not a single Anglo-Catholic. Well, what this essentially says, the truth of this is, is there is no commitment to mutual flourishing. There might be a commitment to put up with each other for as long as we possibly can, so that uh, because it's in the interest of everybody for the whole pack of cards not to fall down. But again, we should tell the truth. This is just not mutual flourishing. On the other hand, Kevin, here's the thing. If the Church of England is committed to mutual flourishing, let it appoint at the earliest opportunity as many Anglo-Catholics from forward in faith to bishoprics and archdeaconries and senior canonries as it has appointed women. And then we would say, oh, look, there's mutual flourishing. It works. But it won't. No, it won't. But boy, <laughs> but you, you want to through, if you want to prove there is no theological challenge, uh, take up Gavin's call, you know, for every uh, female, uh, do an Anglo-Catholic, and, and we'll watch and see if there is mutual flourishing. But I suspect, as Gavin does, that uh, um, this was a false promise, and they're just waiting, 
for the day that there will be no more Anglo-Catholics in the Church of England. I, I read this press release, Kevin, and, and the, the, the title of the film came to me immediately. I, I don't think I've actually seen the film, but the title is quite, is quite poignant. It was called Sleeping with the Enemy. Yeah. And, yeah. and I, thought, I thought to myself, um, the, the fact is that I, I remember writing something when I left General Synod in 2012, and I, I said to members of the Catholic group, um, it's my strong impression that the progressives will not rest until they have driven you out of the church. They may, they may do it by neglect, they may do it by persecution, they may do it by making promises. Uh, and so a lot of people said, look, you know, you, you're wrong, how cynical. We have mutual flourishing and we're all committed to mutual flourishing. And, and in a sense, uh, if you can't square the circle of Anglicanism, and sometimes you can't, well, that would be the least worst way of doing it. But it isn't right to pretend you have a solution and actually not implement it at all. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see if, if people go, uh, if, if there's any, any sense of resistance to Philip, Moore's, to Philip Moore's report and people say, well, this is not good enough. But I'm afraid I think it's just one more, one more effective, I can't use the word cover up really, but, but, but one more effective dodging of the issue in order to let things continue in a downward spiral without dealing with the truth or without dealing with reality. Uh, and in that sense, it's very disappointing. It is. Maybe, you know, we're Anglicans. Maybe we could have some indaba and just talk about it some more, <laughs> you know, while we brush it under the carpet. Um, we've hit the 17-minute magic mark, and I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm Gavin Ashenden. You've been listening to episode 324 of Anglican Unscripted. God bless you. God keep you.